<laughs> How are you guys? How you doing? We're doing good, good, wonderful. Good. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's great, man. It's great to great to connect. This is uh this is fun. <laughs> this is going to be fun for the next hour. We're going to harass you for the next hour. <laughs> no problem, guys. It's so, funny. It's funny. Good to put a face to a face to the voice. <laughs> Instead of looking at that white girl on my page, right? <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah, dude. White girl on your part. That's racist, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's so funny? I've known you for the better part, better part of a decade, even more so. And um, for years, I've always admired your work. And again, thank you for joining us at The Daily Dose. And it was funny because for so long, we never knew how to pronounce your name. I didn't know how to pronounce your name <laughs> until you was on Clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, was, you 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 wouldn't be the first one to crucify my name, but when you when you mentioned my name earlier, I'm like, oh man, that's that's impressive. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I can take I wish I can take credit for it. <laughs> we was in a room and we was in one of the uh, clubhouse rooms. Was it Jermaine? I don't know if it was Jermaine. I think room. Jermaine kept messing you up, messing your name up. He's like, and I said, can you give me a proper pronunciation? Oh, give yeah. me the pronunciation. I said, oh, it's a hard G. <laughs> got it. Got well, it. I mean, I mean, Jermaine, I've known Jermaine for a while. And he, uh, and I'll, I'll say, hey, man, just letting you know that I don't really care if you mispronounce my name. I'm not sensitive about that. But if you call us friends and then you pronounce my name incorrectly, then you look like a dickhead, not me. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? So I'm right like, so but, but even any, if you pronounce yeah. your name correctly, he would still be a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's get that off the list right now. Sorry, Sorry to oh. be asked. Had to on the bus. Um, that's let's funny. get started. Where are you living now? Live in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, been here for about four years. Uh, we lived in LA about uh, for seven years before that. And then every year we try to spend about two or three months in Australia from Melbourne. Um, and obviously this year we couldn't because of COVID. So, so you know, I go to Outback Steakhouse to make myself feel at home. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> See, the only reason I went ill is because I've been to Australia. It is not the same. Well, <laughs> it it's a it's a funny story because one of the first times I came to the U.S., someone invited me. Says, "Ah, oh, we want to make you feel at home. Let's go to Outback Steakhouse." I'm like, "What? What's Outback Steakhouse?" And when I went there, and I'm like. Guys, like, first of all, I'm Greek. Second of all... Right, you're Greek, right. <laughs> I mean, second of all, this is like taking a Mexican to Chipotle to make them feel at home. This is stupid. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, so I'm like, just, yeah, anyway, so it's been a running joke now and stuff. So, yeah, that's all good. <laughs> yeah, because it's funny. When I was doing my research on you, I knew the name Gihonis. I said, that is Greek. Can he live in the, Australia? With the accent. With the <laughs> accent, right, exactly. So let's, let's talk about the cultural differences. Were you born and raised in Australia? Yeah, born and raised in Melbourne. But it's funny because when I'm outside Australia, I, I have to say I'm Australian. But in Australia, if you ask what nationality I am, I call myself Greek because I identify with the Greek culture so much more than the Australian culture. As we talk Greek, we talk, I mean, my mum passed last year, but we talk Greek with my family, my parents, my, my brothers, um, and I love the music, I love the food, the, the, the loud, dramatic culture, and I love it. So I, I strongly identify with the Greek culture, but when I'm outside Australia, I, I call myself Australian, but then when you start looking at it, how hairy I am, you're like, oh, this guy's probably somewhere from, you know. Italy or somewhere Greece else. or, <laughs> or Lebanon somewhere, or somewhere in the Mediterranean. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, how was the culture shock coming from Melbourne to yeah. the U.S.? Oh my God. Okay, so you got to understand my exposure to the U.S. growing up was all from movies. So. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean. Obviously, right? You don't you don't know any different. So you know you you grow up with all the movies that we all grew up with and Happy Days. I thought, you know, Happy Days. Everyone walks into a bar and you, in Cheers, everyone knows your name. And, hey, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and so my one of my first exposures to to the U.S. was someone said, "Let's go to the Cheesecake Factory." I'm like, okay. Um, so I ate dinner before I went to the Cheesecake Factory because I thought I was going there for dessert. Just for, for dessert, right. And then I, I get there, I'm like, well, this is a friggin' full-blown restaurant. I'm like, shit, okay. So I get the menu, it's like a book. And I don't know what to order because there's like three billion things on the, on the menu. So anyway, I'm a guy, I can eat again. So I ate again and, and then I had cheesecake. But 
so that was funny. But then everything was abundant. Like now I, I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a diet coke guy. Right. So, so there I am one of my first meals and you know, I eat my steak or whatever I eat to the point where I sort of have a piece of steak, drink a bit of the diet coke, have a piece of steak, whatever. And then it was about a third of the way down. And then the, and they brought you another full glass. Well, no, they took it away first. I'm like, well, wait, what, what? Like, I'm just, <laughs> I just paid for that. I'm, I'm no tight ass, but don't take away. Like, you don't take a man's drink away from him. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I'm like, and then the people that I was with who were American, they said, I go, look at that freaking waiter. You just took, out my, took away my drink. I didn't even finish it. And then they brought me a new one. And I'm like, this is amazing. This is the <laughs> land. This is the land of the free the refills. So I started downing those Diet Cokes and I used to shove it right on the corner. Like the half the edge of the glass was hanging over the table. In other words, hashtag, I'm ready for another one. Right. And I'm like, this is this country. I mean, all right, it has, you know, lots of shit going on, but damn it, there's still re free refills. So I, you know, <laughs> it, it makes up for all the crap. But um, I mean, I lived in LA, so Beverly Hills, and I, I for seven years, I still freaked out that I, I could walk to Rodeo Drive because it's exotic to me. It's like, oh my God, I can walk to Rodeo Drive. I can walk to West Hollywood or so, you know, all of that stuff, I, I, you know, having grown up and watching these, you know, San Francisco and the crooked streets in Chicago, New York, whatever. One of my first exposés to New York. So I had dreamt for years going to Times Square. Okay. And I remember, I remember going there after 9-11. It was like 2001, 2002. And I don't know if you remember the big blackout that happened in New York. Yes. Okay. So th literally, this is no bullshit. I, the, the, the moment I stepped my foot into the hotel, which was off Times Square, the power cut off. <laughs> and I'm like, did I trip a wire or something? Like, is there <laughs> something going on? And so what happened was, I, as I did that, um, I'm like, well, how do we check in? So we're there for hours and they somehow could check us in. And then oh, they're going to get their money. Oh, absolutely. I don't know how they did it, but they had the swipe machine still worked or whatever. And they finally got through us all. Um, my partner at the time is like my first wife. Basically, it's like we were, uh, she was scared to death because 9-11 just happened. And we thought, oh, my God, something's going on. Right, anyway, so. so a couple hours afterwards, we check in. I go to Times Square. Can you imagine your whole life, you dream of the lights of Times Square, and then you walk in, and all the lights were off. Uh -uh. No, <laughs> no, no signs, no nothing. And this is no bullshit. Within 24 hours, there were T-shirts being sold on the side of the street. I survived the New York blackout. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what New Yorkers That's do. New York. How about if you could friggin' if you can? I mean, power must have been used to actually create those T-shirts. Just, you know. Uh, Get a long extension cord from the Hudson River and plug in the power, for God's sake, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so I don't know. I mean, t shirts made, you can get t shirts made in less than 24 hours, but people can't get their photos for two weeks. I have no, months. I'm right. It'll be months. I, so, how I did you know. like your stay? How did you like New York? Because it's completely different than LA. Look, I, it is very different. Um, I love New York. The energy is amazing. Um, it's a concrete jungle where dreams are made of. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, you know, I, look, I loved it. And I, and I, you know, to be honest, we were deciding to whether to live in New York and LA, like Melissa and I. And having been to, to New York several times uh, leading up to where Melissa and I were going to decide where we're going to live in the US. So I'm like, all right, well, let's go to New York, spend a week there and pretend we're living there. Now, the mistake I made, it was at Christmas time. Oh, there's the deciding so, factor. So I've got five layers on me. I've got this friggin' North Face, you know, like friggin' hoodie. And my face is like this. Now, people who know me know I never get angry. Um, mm. After five minutes just walking the streets, it felt like a cold, wet hand slapping my face mm. continuously. And like I, this. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the weather made me angry. And I'm oh, like, yeah. so you turned into a New Yorker. I Welcome turned into to New York. And now I know why like people are so freaking aggressive in New York. I'm like, yeah, the yeah. weather has got you all screwed up. So, yeah. so, and then, and when you, and when the weather is good, it's usually humid and there's like two months. So I think there's a, 
a romance attached to living in the bigger cities uh, like like right. LA and Chicago, San Fran, but it's so, the cost of living is so high. So when we were in LA, you know, we were at one point, like for four years before we left, we were in a, in a penthouse apartment and it, doesn't, it sounds glamorous. It wasn't as glamorous as it sounds, but on the rooftop of, of a five story building and two bedroom and how do I say, for the same price, we came to Vegas every year for WPPI and for the same <laughs> price, which we're still paying quite high, but we could get this practical mansion that we're living in now and I've got a separate building for an RV, which is a studio, separate place where we broadcast and teach. I've got a pool. I'm like, I just live better here. Um, and people ask me, why do I live here? I'm like, I live better. Like, whereas before, like, I'd have to allow two hours to get to the airport in LA and I'm like, this is ridiculous. So, you know, so... I enjoyed my time there, but I'm having a great time here in Vegas. I, I really enjoy it. So Nice. nice. We came back after we settled, because we're from New York, and after we yeah. settled in California, we, we had to go to back York. to New York in the winter time to do shooting. So we have no coats. <laughs> we had hoodies on. <laughs> we had hoodies on. And we had, uh, like, uh, um, <laughs> little, little uh, yeah, ski hats. Yeah. So we get on, there's, um, there's like this um, train to the plane sort of thing. So we get on this shuttle train. Like six o'clock in the morning, everybody's angry. Everybody, and we literally we were taking photos. And we were taking photos, like yeah, we're in New York. To, yeah, to because send to our friends are surprised when they didn't know, didn't know we were in New York. Town, yeah. So we're taking all these photos and we're looking around. I'm like, why is everybody so goddamn angry? angry. What the fuck is wrong? And then like, <laughs> I turned to him and I said, were we angry too? I was like, it's a good chance. I we said, ten to one, we're angry. So yeah. when, when everybody's angry, it doesn't seem like anger. No. And it was winter time, so. Yeah. Well, well, I didn't realize that, like, for, for us in Australia, like, to go to the snow, you also, you have to travel in the mountains an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. So I had never been exposed to snow in a city. I'm like, I don't even know that was humanly possible. Like, I'm, <laughs> I, I know that sounds so friggin' ignorant, but so I went to Boston with Melissa, and here I'm expecting snow to be like the cartoons where you throw it up and it's all floats and it's fluffy. It floats like, back down now. These are like, they're like small ice cubes. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> Why would yeah. you live in a place where it snows? And because it looks beautiful when it happens, but it looks like shit when it's all banked up and everyone just spreads it out. And mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, walk I walk across it. Yeah, or no, be, I, I'll be in New York and it's sitting on top of garbage. It's like this is a this snow is not garbage. Exactly. <laughs> and, and then there's a and then uh, small things like we rented a car and then there was this scraper for the for the windscreen or oh, windshield, windshield you guys call yes. it. And I'm like, I go, what is it? What 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 is this? What is this tool? What does this do? And Melissa goes, oh, you're such a rookie. And then she's scraping the thing off, whatever. And then she's like, you've got to warm up the engine and there's a way. Don't put hot water on your windshield. Right. And so I know this, but we don't know any different. And then every so often in, in the US, I get introduced to these new things that, how do I say, that you guys have just grown up with and taken for granted. So there'll be a, like a commercial on antidepressants and it'll say this will give you suicidal thoughts and anal leakage. And I'm like, I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather be depressed. I'd rather be disappointed. I, I'd rather be depressed than when I kill myself and freaking leak from my anus. Having my ass <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, okay, all right, don't get me started. Then, <laughs> like, there's a sporting sporting store called Dick. So if I'm going to tennis, I have to buy some balls from Dick. From Dick to go play tennis. <laughs> To go play tennis, and then I need my car service, and I go to Jiffy Lube, which is friggin' rude as hell. Then I go to a restaurant called BJ's, and there's yeah. so much censorship here in the US. I'm like, the shit's right in front of you. Of course, yeah. <laughs> That's why this country is just friggin' like what it, it is, what it is. Because like you know, you pay attention to the shit that you shouldn't, and then there's all this other stuff that like goes unnoticed. I'm like. And then there's the cheese whiz. There's cheese in a freaking tube that lasts for 50 years. I mean, what is yes, that? It's disgusting. Yeah. Uh, and, and like in, milk in Australia lasts for like 10 days. Here, you yes. buy milk, like real milk, real milk, and it lasts for a month. I'm like, what the hell is... <laughs> I, I, and we have a milk here called Parmalat that doesn't need to be refrigerated and can sit on a shelf for two years. Oh. Yeah, that's nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is just, it's disgusting. But I know when I was in Australia, uh, it was some of the most amazing food I have ever had. Yeah, he always the eggs were it. The eggs were Technicolor. I had emu sausage. It was just absolutely 
I mean, emu sausage. I've never had that. I mean, Greeks don't eat emu. That, that's just, and, and we call it an emu. Um, but emu, you, right? But you probably ate Greek. That's probably why it was nice food. Um, because <laughs> I wasn't keen on the alligator, but other than that, I was fine. Listen, yeah. I'm, I'm not wooden, not alligator. That's it's like yeah, Florida. It, it was like, no. <laughs> but let's 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 get off let's get off Bash in New York. It's there for us, and it makes us a lot of money. And that's home. <laughs> so let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about you. All right, Who is Jerry Gionis, and how did he get into photography? So I was given my first camera at the age of 15 by my brother Nick. He was a, like a hobbyist. He had a dark room and. My uncle was an Air Force photographer in Greece. My uncle in Australia, he had done a few weddings. So we come from a, you know, a photographic family per se. Then I became obsessed. I just shot anything and everything. I was that guy with the camera that people got sick of because the camera was attached to me 24 seven. So I knew I wanted to be, I was either gonna be a photographer or a singer. Um, and I or chose a comedian. To, or a comedian, thank you. And then, um, and now I just try to make people laugh while singing, while shooting. Um, so I fulfill, <laughs> I fulfill the, uh, the quote of it. So then I did that relentlessly for, for five years as a hobbyist. I knew I wanted to be a photographer and I knew that I didn't really need high school to do it. So I did what I did to, to pass, but I was a social butterfly. I just had fun. Like I just, mm. I was the guy that, like there were, the, there were the Greeks, the Italians, the Asians, the nerds, the jocks. I was, I was everyone. Like I would hang out with the, the nerds, I'd hang out with the Asians, I'd hang out with the Greeks, the Italians, you know, the druggies without doing the drugs, uh, all that <laughs> stuff. Um, and I was, the, I was the, the glue that put everyone together, you know. Um, so then I finished high school. Um, I worked at a few camera shops just to get into the game. Um, then I, there was a four year photography course that I wanted to do. Now, in fact, the RMIT, which is the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, was sort of like the school to go to for photography. They rejected me saying I wasn't good enough to, even though that I had a, a pretty decent folio as a hobbyist. I'm like, well, that's why I'm here. Like, right. I, I need, like, like, you have to make a, me better. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so anyway, they rejected me. Great, fine. I, and then there was a four year photography course that was more private not so much government funded. So I, I did that for a year and I quit because they were teaching me shit that I would just not ever use. So I, I, left, I left that college after a year. Then I uh, assisted a photographer for about a year and a half. Um, um, no pay, just holding bags. They asked me to work for them full time, which I did um, for about three and a half years. And I bet you learned more there than you did in school. Oh, yeah, it's ridic ridiculous. I mean, in school, it was just all darkroom stuff, which I enjoyed. Then it was just too introspective. You know, save the world through the lens of your camera. Well, <laughs> show, me, show me how to light someone and post someone and communicate, and then maybe we can start doing that after, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I was very much a street smart more than book smart. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I think I'm a smart guy, but I, I, I do consider myself a lot more street. My wife, book smart, 100%. I'm more street smart. I, I prefer wisdom rather than knowledge. Um, nice. You know, and, not, and wisdom, you just have to live, right? So I did that for three and a half years. Um, I quit, started my own business um, in 97. And it was back in the day where um, th there was a recession, like a big recession in the world and let alone in Australia. Interest rates were like 28%. Like, yep, I remember those days. It was insane. So my parents were doing different ventures. One mom was in Pakistani clothing. My dad was sort of like in Greece or outside. Like he, they were trying to make money to save the house. And my mom and dad got estranged, you know. Um, my brother got married. My brother had, um, you know, he had his son in health issues. So I was alone in my house most of like from 12 to like 19, 20, I was alone in this big house. Um, and I remember there's times where I didn't even eat because I, I didn't have enough money. Um, my parents gave me like a credit card for a supermarket, but then that ran out. And I remember one point the gas turned off, the water turned off, electricity turned off. Um, and at one point I go to my house and the bank took over the, 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 my car got repossessed of my brothers because he was overseas and I was driving his car. That got repossessed. And then the banks changed the locks in the house. So wow. it, it, it was a really, really tough time. And at that age also, I got married very young. I got married at 20. I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? Um, so can you imagine at 19, we lost our family home. 
Um, at 20, I got married and then started shooting professionally at 20. And about 23, 24, I started my own business. And my brothers at the time, were, they opened up this charcoal chicken to go food stall and on the corner of a busy suburban area. And then I saw this little door and window opening. And I said, guys, if I can build a wall in your storeroom, can I run my studio <laughs> in this space? And it was the size of a glorified bedroom. And in my, my first year, I shot 25 weddings, my second 50, and then my third year, 100 weddings and portraits. Then I doubled my prices. I occupied more space from the storeroom. And then at one point, we ran out of space again. And then I looked at the air above the building and I went to the overall landlord and I said, you know, could you, um, hey, if you build the second level, I'll pay more rent. And it took me a year to convince him, a year to build. And then... At the end of the day, we, you know, we, we built this, uh, this studio. And at my peak, we were doing 300 plus weddings a year. We were doing hundreds of portraits. And, and that's where I really, really learned my craft in terms of, you know, the, the, the craft of photography, the craft of business. Um, because I was very, uh, you know, I'm very entrepreneurial. Um, and I'm, I believe I'm quite creative. But I find the creativity in business, which most people don't know how to translate their creativity from their, from their work and their camera. They don't really know how to translate that creativity in business. But I can very just flick a switch and say, all right, game on or, you know, let's do this. So, I mean, it's a long story from there, but, you know, that was the quick story to the long story. <laughs> so That was an amazing story to the yes, long story yes, because uh, from adversity creates greatness if you allow it to do so. And yeah. we're glad that you created greatness. Absolutely. Now, how many people did you have working for you for you to do 300 weddings a, a year? year? Yes. We unless, had, was, unless you were shooting them all. Well, I, I was personally shooting about 100 um, several years in a row. I was doing that, plus my portraits during the week and you know, various fashion assignments. Um, we had about, at our peak, 15 staff members. Um, and this was made up of four odd photographers. It was made up of three, four digital artists made up uh, my brother ended up buying into the business eventually bought me out uh completely the, the brother that gave my first camera so he he sold the chicken shop came into photography and so on um yeah 15 15 people and you know i um yeah it was a, an incredible journey and i mean we the very unique thing that we did is we i remember going to the first theater like right now you might go to your local theater and rather than the 200 seat auditorium you've got 30 seats with reclining sofas mm -hmm. so i think australia was one of the first ones to do it and, and in australia we call it gold class and and it was really cool because i went to this movie and it's like 30 people sit and you could order food into the movie Ooh, and all drink, that stuff. Right. gold class so when i walked out of that movie i said i'm going to make my studio the first gold class studio uh and mm -hmm. that's when we built that second level we reinvented the name and then we had six uh, twin sofas, red carpet, big screen, surround sound, and we offered photo and video. And we would blow everybody away. Like basically we would do a joint presentation to six couples at once. And then we would separate after the audio visual presentation and then see who could book the couple quicker. And that's actually smart. That's, that's it, brilliant. And we had a cocktail party almost every Tuesday, Thursday night for years. And it was amazing. I, I can't, I can't tell you the, the growth that we did um and the heyday that it was i i really really like if i wanted to change something in my business i would just test it for a month because i would have 50 couples or whatever i would see in that month do you realize um, what you yeah. did in high school you did in business yeah that's, you that's became crazy. the nucleus because if anybody was coming to your place for presentations and you had the cocktails a lot of these couples were coming together and becoming friends which yeah. isn't much different than what you were doing in high school. No, I, I, I mean, look, I think I was practicing my whole life, <clears throat> excuse me, to be a photographer. Um, I think technique you can teach. I mean, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, lighting, it's not rocket science. Yes, it's easy for us to say who experienced, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's a process that one can learn. But... <laughs> If you're an asshole, it'll probably translate into being a bad photographer with people. Now, you can be a prick and photograph jewelry all day long because <laughs> you don't. Because jewelry's <laughs> not going to talk about it. So, if you're photographing, you know, if you're photographing people, especially an important occasion like weddings and portraits and, you know, anything that's domestic, you, you, 
the, the people that are usually thrive are usually people people. Mm. You know, you can fake it only so long, um, but generally, you know, you, you, those those people get weeded out and don't really have long longevity. They don't or, last long, exactly. Yeah. No, or as I like to call it, longevity. They don't have longevity. Um, so longevity. <laughs> there you have it. Got it. <laughs> So, yeah, man, I, I think that, and, and I feel that if I was the, the grand poobah regulator of photography, I would say, you know, everyone should have a license to practice photography because we, we, we're photographing important occasions um, and there's too many people that can just, you know, open up tomorrow and be in charge of, a, of an important occasion then screw up and, and then it basically ruins it for the rest of us. I don't begrudge, don't begrudge new photographers. I love new photographers because I'm like, I wish you the same joy that I've had in my career. But, um, you know, there are so many things to do. But I, I love the fact that I, my main genre that I've started with and I, I continue to do has been weddings because, you know, if you want a job done, give it to a wedding photographer. Chances are they're going to do it quicker and problem solve better than most people who and have just faster. given, and yeah, who are just given this beautiful model with ten hours to take one shot. I'm like, you know, I'm not begrudging or disrespecting fashion photographers or any other genre. All I'm saying is, <sighs> weddings are a testing ground to for speed and problem solving, and to shoot almost every genre imaginable within this day that you really have to perform rain, hail, or shine. And that's why I. I really appreciate my my upbringing in, in this industry because now, I mean, I, you know, I shoot, I mean, in Vegas, if people know me more as a fashion portrait photographer. Uh, now I'm doing filmmaking. I'm, I, we, we've just shot our second music video. We're doing a documentary. There's like a whole bunch of stuff that we're, we're photographing performers. So it's really given me a, an incredible foundation to pretty much choose any path that I want within people photography. That's been so great. So let me ask you this. Mm. <coughs> what was your... How did you feel when we went from film to digital? And did you and did you embrace it wholeheartedly, or did you have to fight a little bit and realize digital's here to stay? I, I man, I embraced it purely mathematically. The fact is that I looked at all the you know the weddings that I did and all the rolls of film that I shot and the processing and the proofing and the price. And, dude, my first camera was a Kodak DCS seven hundred and sixty. It cost me twenty thousand dollars for my first digital camera. People in the industry complain about a, a Z6 worth two grand. I'm like, dude, if you only... <laughs> they have no idea. If you only knew... I mean, when I started, my first professional camera was a Mamiya RB67. It was 10 shots per roll of film. And I was like a rich guy because I had a 220 back. Um, so at my peak, I was like Rambo. I had friggin' three 220 backs with color, a one, two, one 120 back with black and white, one okay. 120 back with cross-processing, 35 millimeter black and white for candids. And then I had a 35 millimeter black and white for infrared. Um, and every shot was on a tripod, big Mets flash. I'm sounding really old right now, of course, but the, the fact is that the, the tools have become so much simpler and even the transition. So when people, and I say this with respect, people are saying, I'm a fine art film photographer. Screw you. Like, <laughs> let's, just, let's just call it what it is. There's a romantic notion attached to photographing with film. Yes, that is yes, all you've yes, got. That's yes, it. Yes, you, yes. That's all you've got. You can't tell me that you are a better photographer using okay. film. You, like you're, you're wasting 500 bucks. And damned if I can see the difference between someone who knows how to make a digital shot with that film little edge. Um, that looks like yeah. film, right. Like, you know, the kind of person that drives a manual car as opposed to automatic. Automatic cars are so much easier to drive. Why would you drive manual? Well, you want to drive the car. Good for you. But don't tell me that I'm less creative because I shoot digitally. Because that's just, just tell me that you're doing it because it's a romantic notion attached to it. And you want to drive the car. That's all you've got. Don't give me any other bullshit. And that being said, I think there's people that have branded themselves as a fine art film photographer and couples eat that shit up. I'm like, you know what? Good for you. If you can find an angle that, and you've got no other angle, I think it's fantastic. I, I'm not right. begrudging you. I think, I think that's actually quite genius in, in many ways, yeah. but, but you know, so it is what it is. <laughs> My opinion is this a, is this a marketing, is a marketing thing. Like even when we were in clubhouse and they were talking about, Oh, I'm a fine arts photographer and I shoot mostly film. It's like, and the word fine art has changed. It's completely different. When I started mentoring this kid here, <laughs> I, he talked about fine art. So I'm like, show me a fine art. And he would show me all this um, 
like yeah. composited work and otherworldly stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. let me show you what we call as fine art. And I start bringing up beautiful black and whites and stuff like this. And like, yeah, it's no, a different it's ball different. game between the two. And then even my definition to what it is today is not even the same. Uh, not even the same. Like, my fine arts was really like artists using the, the camera and then it'll mix media and it'll be this really big emotional. Installation. Yeah, this thing. And so he was like, what? What is this? And even like now to what it is, it's, it, it's completely different. It's completely different. I think it's just defined by the person who's shooting it. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily a category. It's just, it's... Yeah, I, like I said, look, for, for, for the romance of it, for the branding of it, knock yourself out. I think that, I think to, uh, the, gear, the gear conversation has been happening my entire career. It's not like, I'm, 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 I wonder if like Roger Federer and Djokovic, it's like, oh my God, what strings do you use? I, I don't know. I like, <laughs> I just, for me, I, don't get me wrong. People love to geek out, knock yourself out. But at the end of the day, in 2021, every camera system even though I'm an Econ ambassador, every camera system has got incredible gear at, the, at, at that level. At, at the end of the day, we've got to realize that they're tools. It's what you do with it. Um, if you like to geek out, fantastic. Um, I'm not begrudging anyone. I, if it gives you happiness and joy and peace and it's a, it's a marketing angle, knock yourself out. But, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, I just, you know, you do what you love. You attract people that have the same energy. You make a living from it. I, I, like I said, man, I, I've been doing this for 27 years. Uh, and five years before that as a hobbyist, you know, and you guys have been doing it obviously for a long time. So, you know, you want people to have the same joy and learn from the shit that we've had to freaking go through to get to the shortcuts to do it. Now, obviously there's no, there's no substitute for just repetition experience and practice and wisdom. Um, I just think that people are, want the quick win. I mean, you know what a yes. win for me is? Being here for 27 years, being here for another 27 yeah, exactly. years. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I had yeah. that discussion the other day when I was saying, um, when you want to learn from someone, I want to learn someone who's been in the business for forever so I can understand how to have long longevity. Because and we all know F8. We all, yeah, we all know the camera, the gear, <laughs> so it's going to getting better. It's gonna, but somebody who's been working in the business for 30 and 40 and 50 years is like, what, how did, you know, how did you Where's, where's that magic? Yeah, where's exactly. that magic? So that's why when we talk, uh, we, we had a conversation about how do you um, study? Like, do you learn from your peers or do you learn from people who came before you? I'm not your peer. Shut up. So <laughs> I, I always say learn from the ones who came before you and, you know, study the greats and become greater. Um, don't learn from, you know, I'm John and he, you know, he's trying to figure it out. So... It kind of sucks. So let me ask you this. How did you cross over to the dark side of fashion and all that stuff, leaving, still doing your weddings, but what made you come to this side of the fence? You know, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I had dabbled in fashion here and there, but I couldn't call myself a fashion photographer for like most of my 27 year career. What happened was about five, six years ago, I... I was, I could see myself burning out. I wasn't there yet. I, w I could see it on the wall, right? Because not only do I, I still shoot for a living, but you know, I, I do teach. I, that's a, that's part of my profession. You know, I've been teaching relentlessly for 20 years. I've traveled all over the world long before, you know, uh, learning online was a thing. I've done the pubs and clubs, so to speak, and I've traveled Asia and America several times and Europe and all those. I've been across the US, multiple city tours and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so and then 13 years ago, I started one of the first, you know, online subscription based, you know, photography training websites. And cut a long story short, I give away my energy for a living. This is what I do, right? So you know, I, I, my, my elevator pitch is very simple. I like to bring out the best in people, whether it's making a bride shine bright and creating meaningful portraits for families or whatever I do. So it can get a bit taxing, especially when you, you work, you still work for a living, but then you've got the weight of the world of many tens of thousands of photographers who you've taught and who often reach out to continue the mentorship and it's a fine balance between do you become the Robin Hood of photography and sacrifice your own family life and your, your client experience to, to help everybody else. And there's a bit of a balance there. So valuing my time and valuing my, you know, everything that I do, I said to Melissa, my wife, I said, 
the, July and August this year, I go, I don't want you to book anything. I don't want any speaking engagements. I don't want anything online. I don't want any weddings, portraits, nothing. I just want to play. So then I hooked up with this uh, boutique in, in LA who do these incredible, incredible costumes and everything like that for Gaga, Beyonce, Katy Perry, you name it. And I just said, I want to play. And I, back then I didn't really have a relationship with this company. So at the start I had to pay for a lot of these things. So for two months, I developed this incredible folio of fashion work, having used all of my experience in weddings and portraits and a bit of, bit of dabbling in fashion to do, to do this. And I just loved it. I, um, even to the point where as a symbol of my commitment to that, to this elaborating on the genre that I flirted with, I remember the AIPP, which is our Australian Institute of Professional Photography, they have the annual awards. And every year I had entered wedding, like you enter four prints and then, and that's it. You can't enter multiple categories. And that's the first year I entered fashion photographer and I ended up winning the Australian fashion photographer of the year. I'm like, so for me, and it's not about boasting. It was a symbol of my commitment. And basically for me, I always care about the process, not the result. I didn't care about the award. It, for me, it was, I love the creative process. I'm obsessed with it. So it is people go to the gym and they quit after a day because they don't see muscles. I'm like, well, just freaking go to the gym and just do the work. Like in six months, like you'll, you'll get, you'll have muscles. You have a great metabolism, whatever. So anyone who knows me, I'm relentlessly focused and obsessive when I'm, when I have a commitment to something. So I did that. And then since then, um, being a Nikon ambassador, they ended up giving me the, the, um, the campaign for the D850. So they, although like camera companies will give multiple ambassadors, you know, or non-ambassadors a campaign for a particular thing, they usually will pick two or three that become the worldwide campaign photographer of this particular device. The D850 being a landmark camera at the time, they chose me for the wedding and the fashion industry. So four years ago, coming to, coming to Vegas, I got this campaign and I felt, man, I, this global company have recognized me for a different genre that I've actually been known for, which for me was a huge, a huge thing in my career because it, it's sort of like, you know what, Jerry, you, you know, you've done weddings and portraits, but you, you're acknowledged for the fashion, for the fashion thing. So that was a really, really amazing thing. And then since then, um, yeah, I, I'm doing lots of cool projects. And like I said, even to the point where I'm, you know, we've done, I've directed my second music video and it's, it was very natural for me to go into that because I, I've always dabbled, I've always had video or we always sold video at the studio. So, and I've always, I, I feel like I've got a good eye for, for, for motion and a good ear for, for, for sound in terms of editing and stuff like that. And so now I'm just having a time in my life. I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. And again, I'm just focusing on the process. I don't, you know, the money comes, the, I, I don't, I care about the impressing my clients and, and, and being a hero to my, to my, you know, my clients and my, my family rather than being a hero to photographers, you know? Let me ask you this. We agree with you wholeheartedly, by the way. Yeah. It's like you're, you're speaking our script. You mm -hmm. are one of the most awarded photographers to date. How? <laughs> <laughs> so now I realize if I decide to enter any competition, if I'm going to ask you first, if you're in the competition, then I will not join. <laughs> I'd rather save my money and save my dignity and save my prints I'm before up for I do the challenge. that. I'm up for the challenge. You know how these young kids are. I like smoke. <laughs> well, well, I mean, look, first of all, I know this sounds funny. First of all, you just have to make the step to enter. Like, that's just, you, you've, got to, you've got to play to win. You know, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, also, it's also like playing chess. People are just photographers who enter, who enter their work. For most of my career, I'm playing chess. I'm not photographing and then entering. I'm like, well, strategically, what can I enter that will surprise the judges, do I take a risk? Blah, 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 blah. Like there's a whole, there's a whole methodology to it. Now, don't get me wrong, man. I still enter work that I think is going to friggin' win the whole thing. And then it's nothing. And then sometimes I enter a lazy print that ends up winning the whole thing. And I'm like, well, so, I mean, look, it hasn't been a focus of mine in the last couple of years. I mean, if you know my history, WPPI has been a, a you know, I've been involved in WPPI for the, almost 20 years now. And, 
about six, seven years ago, the competition needed refreshing. There was problems on the awards night. There was, it was a shambles. Then the coordinator at the time of, of director of WPI basically, you know, from like I said, rough, rough week, huh? And I said, yeah. And I said, well, you know what? Like the, the, the competition needs refreshing. The categories are no longer relevant. We need, you know, you might need our help. And then stupidly enough, Melissa and I said, let's help you. So then we, we expanded the categories to reflect the industry. We refined the rules. So composite categories go over here. Non-composites go over here. People were saying, oh, it's a digital, it's a digital art competition. Let's introduce the in-camera artistry award, which is you enter a raw file and we actually judge the embedded JPEG. All these different things. So ultimately, we reinvented WPPI and a lot of countries and their organizations have actually adopted our methodology of different categories, which we're really proud of. And for the first five years of doing this, which took months of our life and obviously lots of lost income for the last year or two, we're finally getting paid a little bit to, 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 to run this competition. So I legally can't enter WPPI at, uh, at least while we're running the competition, which half of me says, damn it, because I, I like to lead by example and show my students that I continue to reinvent myself and enter uh, and lead by example. Whether I win or not is not, is no consequence. It's just the fact that the, the process of doing it. So to this day, literally every single print physically comes to our house and we unpack them, um, we barcode them, we put them in their categories, put them in the order, uh, we put them in the crates, they go to Vegas, we handle 60 odd judges, 50 odd print handlers, hangers, like there's a lot of friggin' work. And, you know, we don't, we don't need a, a trophy for that. It's a, it's a gift for the industry. Um, the entering though, going back to the question, just how have I won these awards? It's just commitment, commitment to, 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 to being the best I can be. Um, it doesn't make me the best because we all know, especially on Clubhouse, you go on Clubhouse and just when you think you're good, you get exposed to these photographers that you have no idea existed and are 10 times better than all of us. And the fact is that if they probably entered, we probably wouldn't have won. So there's a little bit of luck. There's, a, there's obviously some skill. There's a bit of timing. And, you know, strategically, some people just copy a winning formula and hope to win, which is silly. And then some people will push the boundary and I tend to do it simply. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really add too many bells and whistles to my work. It's, it's very basic and simple. I would probably say my obsession with albums over the years, a lot of people who know my work, who follow my career know that I have pushed the boundaries a lot in my album work. Like it's funny because I would, like after the first few years of entering WPPI, I had got perfect 100s, I won grand awards and I'd won three album of the years in a row, whatever. And then people started to understand, oh, that's Jerry's work. And strategically I'm like, well, if I just give you what I normally do, I'll, at best I'll be second best or I'll get third place, whatever. I remember one year I, I entered this album that was vintage inspired. Like I made it look like a 70 year old, uh, sorry, an album that was from the 50s. And I shot a little bit looser, a little bit more photojournalistically, a little bit rawer. And I actually even made the album look old and weathered. And I even ended up using the, a, t a torn photograph on the edge and um, desaturated sepias and, and stuff. And, and then a decoy was that I put an album that's, here's what Jerry normally does. And then I did a more photojournalistic version of what I do. And then there was this, this curveball. And that year... I remember someone coming up to me at a party and said, oh, Jerry, I think I judge your work. I don't know, but it's anonymous, but you know what? I think you may have come second or third, but who, what, whose was this vintage album that came out of nowhere? I'm like, I have no idea. Oh my God, it, it was brilliant. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, just joking around. I'm just joking around. But that's when I knew, holy shit. Like, and then I jumped in the, literally in the corridor and I started fist pumping um, and then the, on the awards night, third place, Jerry Gionis, second place, Jerry Gionis, and first place goes to Jerry Gionis. And the clap was like this. It was like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I guess what I'm getting at is like, and then every year it'd be something different. And then like back then with the digital wedding forum and other things, all right, Jerry's good and all, but he doesn't shoot photojournalistically. Oh, look, of course I do. I just don't wave that as a badge of honor. Like I, it's, it's hard to teach photojournalism. So for me, right. I'm like, 
I popularize, I repopularize, you know, turning the ordinary into the extraordinary or, you know, creating something out of nothing, the MacGyver approach. And I, very early in my career when I taught, I had the foresight to shoot the behind the scenes long before most, if not anyone did it because, you know, my assistant said, not many people see like you do. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, well, just, you know, let's photograph your, what, you know, that TD room and what you do with it. So I developed this sort of big body of work, but also from a teaching perspective, it was, it was really fun to show people, hey, the misconception is you need a really beautiful bride in a beautiful location to produce beautiful work. I mean, that's just not true. And, and that's when I started developing that. And then again, every, every year I'd push the boundary. I made an album look like a fashion magazine. I, we created with Graphic Studio the world's first leather album where every page was leather. It would flop in your hands. Um, nice. we I, I shot a wedding in 3D. It never been done before. So I learned how to shoot in 3D and I shot a wedding in 3D. And, and the, the, the judges wore glasses. Um, you know, so, you know, every year I was like pushing it, pushing it. And, you know, um, it, it, it's been a fun journey. I mean, I, 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 I get a bit embarrassed by it. That's why I'm, I'm turning the camera like this. But, you know, all of these... No, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. You know, that. All, all of these... For me, it's not an ego thing. Every I could look at every trophy and tell you the story behind the creative process that led me to that particular thing. So when I walk into my study every day to work, I don't walk in and go, look how amazing I am. I'm like, you know what? You're only as good as your last shoot. Uh, be humble, be hungry, and remember everything that you did to get to that, to, that led you to that process. And remember that there are some photographs and albums that you did that did do anything in competition, but won the hearts of, my, of, the, of the couples and the families um, and just ended up being this, like that 3D wedding, for example, um, it ended up getting the highest score of, of the competition at WPPI, but it gets rejudged and it got third. It didn't even get third place. So I'm like, what is a guy going to do? <laughs> and it was a really good wedding as well. But then I'm like, I was really upset. I'm like, what the hell? Like, what is a guy going to do to win a competition again around here? And like, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> it's a 3D wedding. It's never been done. You know, whatever, whatever. Um, and, but then it won in Australia and I sort of got validated, but, so that, that, that first instinct was to be upset. I'm like, wait, wait a second. I learned how to shoot in 3D, how to create an anaglyph. And I'm like, what an incredible journey. And to this day, I sometimes show audiences of a thousand people and I, I have 3D glasses on every single seat and they're watching this and they're like, oh my God, that was, that's inspired me to go out there and create. So, and that's the, that's the true That's award. far more important, right? Far mm -hmm. more important. So, so like I said, man, it's, it's, been a, it's been an incredible journey. Again, I haven't been as active. I'm not, I, I, I feel like, you know, don't get me wrong. Will I enter the arena again in competition? Maybe at the moment, I'm just enjoying my, my journey. I've got so much work that no one has seen before. Um, and because I film most of my shoots, because we release content every single week for my training program. So <laughs> I've done that for 13 years. Every single week, there's a new episode. I don't, think there's, I don't think there's anyone in the world that can say that. Um, and I'm not saying it in an egotistical way. I'm just saying my commitment to constantly producing is really, is always still there. And if I, knock on wood, got hit by a bus tomorrow, I've probably got another 10 years of content that, that could outlive me. So you're like so, the prince. You're like prince of photography. Or Tupac. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... I love the comparison, but I'd like to live. Thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the, we've been, WPPI and all of these agencies have been courting us right now <clears throat> because clearly Black is in vogue. Have you seen a change over the landscape of these organizations that have been lily white to start becoming more diverse? There's no question. Absolutely. And... <sighs> Look, it's a, bi it's, a, it's a big conversation. I, you know, WPPI, a lot of people will, will just throw stones and whatever, whatever. And I'm like, like, did you know that there was a diversity panel like last year before the reignition, the re you know, the reignited of, of the Black Lives Matter? There was a diversity panel about how important it is to be represented and everything like that. Do you know there was only about 70 people in the room where it could fit a thousand people? Um, Nothing like lit. So what I'm getting at is, let's face it, everyone can do better. Everybody. 
Everyone can be more empathetic to their fellow man and woman, whatever it may be. We all can do better. Organizations, I think at the very, very least should reflect minorities equivalent to what the minorities are in that, in that, in that country at the very minimum. So minorities in this country, about 20% from what I understand, maybe African-Americans, maybe 10%. Um, that should be the case. Now, I think there's no doubt. I think that what's happened is that there's a, it's, it's a twofold problem. Not only should there be representation, you also don't want to be chosen to represent a role just because of the color Merely of your skin. Merely because. But it, sh it should, there should be, you, you are on my radar. Like, for example, Dallas, uh, I didn't know of you until Clubhouse. In fact, I've been introduced to so many African-American photographers who I didn't even know existed. Now, it's not racist. You're just not on my radar. At the same time, there's so many people that have no idea who I am. Doesn't mean you're racist. It's just I'm not on your radar. So the, the fact is that, you know, it, sometimes you're just ignorant. There's a, there's a small circle that you're in and you have no, people have no idea who this is, that is, whatever. Not only, to be honest, it's not only representation of minorities, it should be representation of some grey hair, <laughs> obviously female photographers, whatever. Like even now at WPPI, you know, for me, we need more African-American photographers who, who can be judges and chairmen. There needs to, now, if I ask, if, if you ask me how many African-American photographers enter the competition and who actively have put up their hand to be print handlers, hangers and judges, very few. Now, so, but we want to like say, you know what? Yes, this is important. We need to represent. So the education process starts like, hey, if you want to be on our radar, be on our radar. And not only do you have to be on our radar, it's also, it's a responsibility from companies to search for those people, not just right. wait there for the hand to be up. I mean, look, last year, you know, I was one of those white people that had a rude awakening um, with George Floyd and, and everything that happened where, in, like in Australia, I could spend months not seeing one black person, one. Even though we have an indigenous culture and same thing happened in Australia and America where the white man came along and just killed a whole, uh, you know, a whole, uh, you know, uh, culture. Um, and long history and all that. We took the land away, so to speak. But, you know, and having grown up watching movies about, you know, racism and stuff, I had never really experienced it properly for myself. Um, even though I've got a lot of black friends, I've got a lot of gay friends, whatever. I had never really experienced it. And having, like, during that time with George and what happened, that those five days, even a few, a few days after it, I'm like... Because sometimes I just have a social media blackout for like literally for for so month weeks. I'm like I don't care. It doesn't. But this is just. I'm just focusing on my work. And then every time, oh, let me just pop on and see what's happening on social media. Then I saw what happened, and I'm not want to get political and in what George Floyd was and did. And no one deserves to be to be killed and treated like that. Simple, you know. Um, I just saw the eight minutes and forty six seconds, and I bawled for an hour. I cried for an hour. I had never seen non in wartime someone getting killed on camera. Never seen that in my life. And I remember going on Facebook and I just had to express my feelings and I was bawling for an hour. And I said, I'm ignorant. I have no, I have no idea how privileged I am also as an immigrant, because I'm a, <laughs> I'm also a minority. I'm an Australian Greek American. I, don't get me wrong. I'm nowhere near, uh, I don't have nowhere near the challenges that, you know, that the African-American culture, like the Asian uh, Americans and all the crap that they're going through at the moment or have gone through for, 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 for forever, never experienced that. So for me, I just admitted my ignorance. I just like, you know what? Yeah, guys, we all should do better. We, we need to be conscious of our fellow man and, and woman and and, you know, and then some people could dismiss me as, oh, well, now you're welcome. I'm like, well, you know what? I, I try to just lead by example, by being empathetic and looking after my fellow, you know, person. And I, I believe it starts with you as an individual and then your community because people have, you know, say to, that, Jerry, you're a leader in the community. I'm like, I can lead by example, by being empathetic and looking after people, black, white, Asian. I don't really care. It doesn't worry me. 
So I've never really discriminated in terms of the people that I help and the people that I, that I, that, and, and that's the thing is that there's a fine balance between all of these different things. I just think it all starts with you as a human you, and the person next to you. If everyone treated the person next to them with respect and understanding that by simply being white, you've been given uh, an advantage you know what? Admit it. It's easier being white. Let's just admit it. Come on. Like you, you, you can't ignore it. And, and if you do, then, you know, uh, that's just sad. So like I said, man, I, I, I think that there is a huge responsibility that there's a fine line between picking someone to represent a brand just because you're black, just because you're Asian. Um, if the skill doesn't match, I think there's enough people out there that are incredible at what they do for minorities to be represented by these different companies and to be discerning so that not only um, we like companies are choosing people to, for representation, but they're also picking people that actually represent skill and, and leadership and all these different things. So there's a fine balance there. I think that are there some brands out there that choose people that probably don't quite deserve it and are doing it because minorities i think there's truth to that i think we can all admit that but i think but what's the answer not doing it at all i just think that i love the fact that so many communities so many companies are waking up and i don't it doesn't matter whether it's 400 years too late the fact is that it all starts with individuals it starts with people and companies and positions of leadership and that's what i'm just trying to say is that and I've even said to, you know, uh, having those very difficult conversations, you know what, like, yes, I, I did, I've come here to live for opportunity. I live here away from my family in America for opportunity. I didn't realize, you know, what, what that was built on, the foundation of what that was built on. And I'm just saying, and I said, I'm ignorant, totally admit it. And I'm going to be, even though I'm very empathetic as a person, people who know me know that I, I fully acknowledge that I am, I am privileged. Um, and I'm, I'm going to continue to use my, you know, my privilege, um, for strength and unity and, and lead by example, you know, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> we are at a two minute morning. Yeah, they give us been, a warning. They give us a warning. We <laughs> want to thank you so much so for joining much. us. You are hilarious. You are an amazing <laughs> human being. And yeah. thank you. And this is the last thing we have to do. We have to get a nice shot for our thumbnail. So we're going to hold a pose for five seconds. So get your face ready. Ready? <laughs> Let's, do Let's do this. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. And bravo. <laughs> very, very happy to have got to know a lot more about you. Yes. I'm glad that you know who we are now. Absolutely. And I thank God for Clubhouse because this would never have happened. Yeah. No, and man, Jermaine, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Jermaine too. And Jermaine. Jermaine introduced me to you. Jermaine talks about Sony and Jerry yeah, all the time. Oh, like my friend Jerry, like my friend Jerry. It's like, okay. My I got mentor, you. Jerry. He's your friend. My got mentor, it. Jerry Giannis. Got it. My mentor, <laughs> Jerry Giannis. <laughs> but Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Absolute we'll pleasure and honor. We'll see you again. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.